What a wonderful, wonderful privilege we have to worship. Amen? I hope everyone, I said this a little while ago, but I, have, I hope everyone had a wonderful Independence Day. If, uh, if you didn't do a whole lot, that's okay, because I didn't do a whole lot. Just replenished uh, some hunting gear on Thursday, and that's about it, really. But uh, that season will be here before we know it, that's for sure. Time just flies. It's already after the 4th of July, so we are, we are halfway through the year, and man, it goes fast. But uh, what a privilege it is we have to gather in God's house this morning. Turn with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter number 21 this morning, and I'm going to do something a little bit different than normal this, uh, this Sunday. You remember I quoted to you a little while back Einstein's definition of, of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. But um, it doesn't hurt to do things a little bit different every now and then. So uh, I'm not going to do the normal thing where I read the text and have everyone stand and then get into the message. We're going to read the text together, and I'm going to kind of uh, do some expository uh, talk of it as we go through, and then we're going to get into the specific topic that we're going to read about this morning. But in uh, 1 Kings chapter number 21, we're going to read verses 1 through 16. And here's the title of our message today. My father gave it to me, you can't have it. Now we'll, we're going to go ahead and go to God in prayer before we read the scriptures. So let's pray. Father God, thank you once again for giving us this day where we could gather and worship you. And Lord, thank you so much for all that we've done for you this morning. For the praises that we've sang, for uh, just being able to fellowship one with another in, in Christian love and uh, forgiving uh, of our of our treasure to you, Lord, what a privilege it is to worship you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for your word now. As we open your word, as we seek to, to find the, the instruction that you have for us, Lord, I pray that our, our reading of your word today will be blessed. Lord, I pray that the message will be blessed. Lord, I pray that you'll anoint the messenger with, with what's needed this morning. Lord, may everything said today be what you would have said. Lord, I pray that you anoint the hearts and the ears of those who will hear, both here and on the video, Lord. I pray that you'll speak to us. I pray that you'll challenge us, Lord. I pray where conviction is necessary that you'll convict us, Lord. Lord, over and above anything that we could ask, if there is but one that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Lord, our mission is to witness for you. And so, Lord, it's our desire that if there's someone that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, perhaps who will watch this video, Lord, may you speak to them and bring them to the knowledge of the saving grace that's found in Jesus Christ, in him and in him alone. And we ask all of this in his name. The church said, amen and amen. So let's get into our scripture this morning in the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 21 starting in verse number one. And like I said, I'm going to read the scripture expositionally. Y'all like that big term? Throughout the message versus the normal way. And uh, we will get into what God has for us this morning. First Kings chapter 21, starting in verse number one. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Now let me stop right there. So you all heard of King Ahab, I'm sure. He was a ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria, from about 869 to 850 B.C. And he was married, as you know, to the wicked Jezebel. And under her influence, Ahab abandoned the God of Israel and establish Baal worship in Israel. Let me recount for you what 1 Kings chapter number 16 and verse 33 says about this. It says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger, more than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Think about that right there. We start off this text this morning talking about this wicked king right here. Uh, put, it, put it simply, Ahab was spineless, Jezebel was wicked, and then together they caused a great deal of evil. Sound like a headline we might see nowadays, doesn't it, folks? But in any case, we see in verse number one here that uh, this man Naboth, he owned a vineyard which was, the King James puts it, hard by the palace of Ahab. What he means right there is that it, it, it met 
the palace of Ahab. Think about it this way. If we took that outside wall there and put a vineyard right next to it, that's exactly the picture that we're looking at right there. So Naboth has this vineyard, and it's right there at the palace of Ahab. Let's move forward to verse number 2. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Seems like a reasonable request, doesn't it? This vineyard is right next to my palace. Uh, Naboth, let me buy it from you or let me trade it for something. But then let's look at verse number 3. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give thee the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Verse number 4. And Ahab came unto the house heavy and displeased. Basically, he was upset, he was mad, he was sad. Heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. Sounds like, sounds like a mad child, doesn't it? Verse number 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, why is thy spirit so sad that, thy, that thou eats no bread? Verse 6. And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Verse 7. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now, now govern the kingdom of Israel? Basically, I think it was probably the, the equivalent of slapping him in the face and saying, Aren't you the king? Don't you think you can do a little bit better than, than what you're telling me? Do you not govern the uh, kingdom of Israel? Get up, arise, and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So let's look at what she does in verse number 8. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high upon it, among his people, and set two men, sons of Belial, or sons of evil, worthless men, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Remind you, the, the punishment for blasphemy was what? Stoning. Verse number 11. And the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, basically false witnessing, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Verse 14. Then they sent to Jezebel. Basically, they, they, they sent her a letter back. Naboth is stoned and is dead. Verse 15. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. Verse 16. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth, Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Now I want to remind you of verse number 3. It's where we get our title from. Naboth said to Ahab, Ahab The Lord forbid it me, that I should give thee the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Basically, what he say? He said, my father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Here's a very simple narrative. Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. Now, I said a minute ago, on the face of it, it looks legitimate. Any one of us may have found ourselves in, the, in a similar situation. Something may have looked please, pleasing to us, and we may have wanted to make an offer for it. It's, it's not the issue that Ahab wanted it, it's the issue of what happened when he said he wanted it. So here's the very simple narrative. Ahab wanted the vineyard. Naboth didn't want to give it to him. He didn't want to sell it. He didn't want to trade it. 
Now Ahab, we see like a spoiled child, whined about it, threw a tantrum, lay on his bed and cried and wouldn't eat. So his wicked wife cooked up a scheme to get the vineyard. The scheme worked, and Ahab took the vineyard. I remind you of something. If Hollywood was this talented nowadays, movies might be great again. If, if the people in Hollywood could come up with such a, such a story, imagine what wonderful movies we would see nowadays. But I want to remind you in verse number 3 again. Naboth says to Ahab, My father gave it to me and you can't have it. Naboth no doubt treasures the inheritance that his father had left for him. He rightly wanted to keep it. There's nothing wrong with that. He perhaps wanted to continue to keep it in the family, whatever he wanted to do. The bottom line is Naboth didn't want to get rid of it. He said, my father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Let me ask you a question, folks. Did you ever have something that you cherished more than anything? Perhaps it's some sort of inheritance, perhaps, uh, perhaps another type of gift someone may have gave you or whatever, but you don't have any desire to give it up. And let me remind you, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to keep something that you have. Now, possessions, money, we know those are just things, they're fleeting, they don't last, but there's nothing wrong with us wanting to keep something that perhaps someone gave us. And there's nothing wrong with saying... My father gave it to me, and you can't have it. May I submit to us all, we need to tell this to the devil. My father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Now, let me say first and foremost that the devil cannot take your salvation. I don't care what anybody might have tried to teach you. When you got your salvation, it was for keeps. The Bible tells us that when we come to the saving knowledge of Christ, we are sealed. You say to yourself, how on earth can you prove that? I got, I got, I got two verses I can share with you. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. I'm not going to read it, but you can look it up later. And Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30, just to name a few. When you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you will not lose that salvation. God's not going to give you a gift and then take it away from you. Now, I know that there are some groups, there are some traditions that go on along and they say, well, you can probably lose your salvation. Or maybe, maybe they don't say probably. Maybe they definitely say you can lose your salvation. Well, I'm convinced that people that think that never had it to start with. But I sure am glad on the authority of the Word of God that when I trusted Jesus at the age of six, I was sealed and that can't be taken away. But sadly, there are some things that our Father gave us that the devil wants. And we need to tell him, my Father gave it to me, and you can't have it. There are some things that the devil will, will try and take from us. We've talked about it before, to break that fellowship between us and God. He can't take your salvation, but he can take your testimony he can take your fellowship. He can take all those things. Now, the list I'm going to give you today is not all-inclusive, but I think it makes a good representation of the things that our Father gave us. The devil wants it, but we got to say, Devil, my Father gave it to me, and you can't have it. And the first is this. Very, very poignant because it's July the 4th, after July the 4th weekend. The first one is our freedom. Now, there are two sides from that. The first one is our freedom as Americans, and the second is our freedom from the bondage of sin. Now, Americans, Independence, Independence Day was this past Thursday. We dare not forget who gave us that freedom. Politicians, by the way, didn't give us that freedom. A politician couldn't find a coherent thought with two hands and a flashlight. They did not give us that freedom. And oh, by the way, they're not the ones that can take it away from us. And you say, how on earth do you say that from the pulpit? Because I'm an American, I'm a voter, and I'm a taxpayer. And as long as that rings true, I'm going to say what I want about who I want. Amen? Come on. God gave us that freedom. Politicians didn't do it. Government didn't do it. God did it. I'm going to read to you. I have a copy of the Declaration of Independence. 
I recommend you have one too if you don't. But let me read to you the words of that that proves to us that God gave us our freedom. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They are endowed by their creator. Folks, God gave us our freedom, and we dare not let anybody take it away from us. Now, I said a little while ago, in our current history classes in high school, they don't want you to know that God gave us our freedom. But I got news for you. Nobody's erased the Declaration of Independence. And I've seen it. Y'all may have seen it too at the archives in Washington. Uh, that line is still in there. But so many people want to take it from us. Those politicians I mentioned want to take it from us. But you know something? They can't have something God gave me. My Father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Let's turn that coin over. Christians, we are free from the bondage of sin. Satan wants us to be under that bondage, but we're free from that bondage. Now, let me see if I can break this down a little bit for us. We're free from the bondage, but that doesn't mean we can't get involved in it. And that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants us to be under that bondage. He wants us to be, uh, if you'll allow me to use the term, go back to our old ways. But we need to tell him, my father gave it to me and you can't have it. My father gave me my freedom as an American. My father gave me my freedom in Christ and you can't have it. Let me read a couple of verses to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 17. You're a Christian, this rings true for you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1, Paul exhorts us to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Devil, God gave me my freedom and you can't have it. But there's more to it than that. God gave us our peace. Christian, you know the Lord as your Savior. You have peace with God. And you know that, that'll encourage you when you look at the headlines and you look at whatever news source that you get. And, and God knows, don't look at it very long because you'll get depressed. But you can have peace because you belong to God. You can have peace because you are accounted in the family of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let me read to you what Jesus tells us in John chapter number 14 and verse 27. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Listen to this part. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The world can't give you peace. I mentioned politicians a minute ago. God knows they can't give you peace possessions. There's nothing wrong with possessions, but it can't give you peace. You know what gives you peace? Jesus Christ. He says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give unto you. Because of that, he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Aren't you glad today, Christian, that because you belong to the Lord, you have peace. And it's real easy to lose that peace in a world that wants you to lose that peace. Oh, man, there's sickness running rampant. What am I going to do? It's hot as the Dickens in July. Imagine that. What am I going to do? Christian, we can have peace in the midst of all of that. And you know what? God gave it to us. You know the Lord today. God gave you peace, and you need to tell the devil, my father gave it to me, and you can't have it. But what else? How about this one? I've talked about this a lot, and I'll continue to talk about it. Our victory. Listen to what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, God gave you victory. Our Father gave you the victory. And we need to tell the devil, my Father gave it to me and you can't have it. Let me uh, share with you from the book of Romans as well. It speaks to our victory. Romans chapter number 8, verse 35, very familiar portion. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Oh, by the way, folks, you Christian, you have the love of Christ and nobody can separate you from it. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse number 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor present nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Christian, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You have victory. My Father gave it to me and you can't have it. Another one of my very favorites, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, once again, I always have to give a disclaimer because folks get this mixed up so much. Paul is not telling us to go stand in front of a, ro a running train because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's telling us that because of Christ who strengthens us, because of Christ who gave us the victory, we can deal with what goes on beyond these doors. Because of Christ who gave us the victory, we can deal when sickness comes. Because of Christ who gave us the victory, we can deal when heartache comes. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Why? Because I have victory. My Father gave it to me, devil. You can't have it. Well, what else? How about this one? I'm almost done, by the way. Our hope. You know what, Christian? Christian? Because you have Jesus Christ, you have hope. More than that, God gave you that hope. And you need to tell the devil, my father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Titus chapter number 2 and verse 13, Paul tells us these words. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, of, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christian, we might have difficulties right now. We might have uncertainties. We might have problems that beset us. But we're looking forward to that blessed hope. Christian, God has given us hope. I want to read to you also from 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 13 through 17. Paul says these words, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica, and he tells us as well as God's children, we don't sorrow as people who have no hope. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Here's our blessed hope, by the way. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. You know what, folks? We might, I said a minute ago, have difficulties. We might have hard rows to hoe, as the old folks might say but we still have hope. And you know who gave us that hope? God gave us that hope. God gave us that hope when he gave us Jesus Christ. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God gave you hope, and you need to tell the devil, my Father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Last but not least, here's something that our Father gave us, and we need to tell the devil he can't have it. It is another opportunity. Another opportunity. Opportunity. What do I mean by that? I mean two things. Number one, salvation for the lost and continued grace for those of us who are saved and are in the battle. Put quite simply, it's the message of salvation. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He shed his blood and he died on that cross to pay the sin debt. And then three days later, he rose from the grave to give us the victory over death and the grave. And all us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior... Have that victory, have that hope, have that peace, have that freedom. And then, guess what? We've got another opportunity. Why do I say that? Because we mess up sometimes, don't we? Because we will look at the ills going on in the world and we'll say, oh, woe is me, God has forgotten about me. Another opportunity 
at grace. Aren't you glad today that when you belong to the Lord, no matter what may go on during your day, you still got the Lord as your, uh, we'll, we'll say safety net, but it's not, it's not a good term. I just couldn't think of a better one right now. But we still got another opportunity at God's grace. Every morning when you wake up on this side of eternity, you've got another opportunity at God's grace. I've given the I've given the illustration before of the reset button, like on old video games, not the new nonsense they got nowadays, but the old video games where you weren't doing as good as you thought you might. What could you do? You could always hit that reset button. Christian, you know we got a reset button. We might not always do what, what we should do. We might not always say, think, or feel what we should think or feel. But I sure am glad that because of the grace of God, because of all that God has given me, I've got that reset button. It's called forgiveness. You know Christ is Lord and Savior. You've got forgiveness. And you know there are many that are living under the bondages, bondage of sin. There are many who are living without the grace of God, without peace, without hope, without mercy. Jesus died for them. You see, I say it so often, and we can gather here, and my prayer is each and every one of us knows Jesus Christ as, our, as Lord and Savior. But we can gather in here, and we can feel so insulated and so isolated in our, in our faith. But we need to remember, folks, there's a, there's a group out there that don't know God, that needs to know God. And you know who, who, equips for, who he equips for that? You and me. So... Here is our mission, Christians. First and foremost, tell the devil, my father gave it to me, and you can't have it. Secondly, be what God wants us to be. Be a great big billboard for our freedom, our peace, our victory, our hope, and for another opportunity. In just a minute, we're going to commemorate, we're going to memorialize the sacrifice that Christ made for each and every one of us. And I said it just a minute ago, and I'll say it again. Here was the sacrifice. Jesus' body and his blood. And he hung upon the cross and shed, not spilled, shed his blood for each and every one of us. And you know what? God still offers that opportunity to the lost, and he still offers that grace to the saved that need that grace. And you know something I'm thankful for? I saw something on TV the other day, and a guy, had a, uh, a guy had a crucifix hanging on the wall. And you know, I got to thinking about that. On the crucifix, y'all have seen him. Christ is still on the cross. But I sure am glad he came down off that cross. He's not still on the cross, folks. He already paid that price, and he already won that victory. You know Jesus Christ today? Because of that, my Father gave me freedom, victory, hope. And devil, you can't take it away. Let's pray. Father God, we ask today...